Another Sunday, another bunch of pro football players kneeling during the national anthem. Well, we thought it was about time the NFL got the swamp watch treatment. And sure enough, it turns out that the grass those players are kneeling on is actually a swamp full of lying lobbyists, puppet politicians and taxpayer dollars subsidizing brazen billionaires. The National Football League is tonight's swamp watch. President Trump's call for NFL owners to fire players protesting our flag and anthem was far from his first dust-up with the league. He even bid to own teams in the past, and why wouldn't he? Owning a pro football team is a total cash cow, especially when you can send a bill for your biggest expense to taxpayers who struggle to afford a seat, even in the nosebleed section where they pay more than $10 for a beer. Shockingly, one study found that 70% of the capital cost of NFL stadiums has been paid not by owners, but taxpayers. Step forward, Seattle Seahawks owner Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, along with Bill Gates, and one of the world's richest men. He got Washington State residents to pay $390 million of the $560 million cost for his stadium. I guess that's why he's one of the world's richest men. He gets taxpayers to subsidize his hobbies. Just like Minnesota Vikings owner Zygmunt Wilf, the state legislature handed over $506 million from taxpayers towards his new stadium, even though the state was facing a billion-dollar budget deficit. Then there's New Orleans, which has one of the country's highest poverty rates. But that didn't stop Saints owner Tom Benson from taking a cool billion, that's right, a billion dollars in taxpayer money to build Mercedes-Benz Stadium. These subsidies dwarf the rental fees that teams pay and are basically just gifts to owners. So let's get this straight. We help pay for billionaires' fancy stadiums, and then they keep almost all the profits from tickets, parking, beer, and hot dogs. They charge an average of $85 for a non-premium seat. You can forget about a pricey premium seat. And another $30 for parking. Want to take your family of four to watch the Cowboys play the Packers? You're looking at, what, four, maybe $450. Good luck with that when half of American workers earn less than $850 a week, especially after the state pilfers your taxes to help out poor billionaire owners with their expenses. And it's not just construction costs your tax dollars go to. Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal, who likes to portray himself as a frugal, cost-cutting conservative, sends the New Orleans Saints six million a year in so-called inducement payments, just to convince the team not to move. I'm sure you'd like an inducement payment to literally do nothing. In fact, politicians are so generous with your money that the Saints are one of 12 teams that have actually turned a profit on stadium subsidies alone. Yes, they received more money than it cost to build their facilities. I know. How the hell does that work? Only in the public sector. But it gets worse. Until just two years ago, the NFL was considered to be a non-profit, meaning it did not have to pay taxes on its massive earnings. This, while league commissioner Roger Goodell was earning a cool $40 million a year, making him the highest paid non-profit executive in the country. Finally, after bad publicity, the league gave up that designation, but only after saving around $109 million in taxes over a 10-year period, a tax burden that was shifted onto you. Now, a large portion of the league's revenue comes from selling broadcast rights for a total of $54 billion. To negotiate as one entity on behalf of 32 teams, the federal government gives the NFL an antitrust waiver, protecting it from the type of lawsuits that Microsoft faced in the 90s. Being a legal monopoly has allowed the league to cut a lucrative deal with DirecTV. The only way you can watch every game is by forking out a hefty $70 a month. No wonder that some of the NFL's critics are calling on the government to revoke the league's antitrust exemption. They're able to keep their sweetheart treatment, though, because the NFL spends nearly twice as much on lobbying as the other three sports leagues combined. <coughs> And they're the only sports league with a full-time lobbying operation in the Washington, D.C. swamp. They hired Joe Biden's former senior attorney, Cynthia Hogan, as their top lobbyist and set up shop in a new office six blocks from the White House. They share space with the league's powerful swampy law firm, Covington and Burling. Yes, them again, who you might remember from a previous swamp watch for their connections to Eric Holder and his soft stance on white-collar crime. But all that lobbying can't help the public relations crisis the NFL is now facing. When players kneel and supposedly protest criminal justice, don't forget that a disturbing number of them are criminals themselves. The website NFLarrest.com tracks all their run-ins with the law, at least those we know about. Since 2000, there have been at least 218 arrests of NFL players for drunk driving, 100 for drugs, 98 for domestic violence, and 74 for assault. In fact, 
Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones has had so much trouble with his players' crimes that he's hired an ex-cop called David Wells as the team's fixer to make their arrest problems quickly, you know, go away. And according to Wells, the troubling stats are lowballed. He said, for every incident that generates a negative headline, ten are handled without the public's knowledge. How reassuring. Even after the horrible Ray Rice domestic violence assault, pro football is still prioritizing victories over the victims of their players' bad behavior. During this year's draft, at least half a dozen players who've been accused of physical or sexual assault were welcomed into the league with open arms. That includes Jacksonville Jaguars wide receiver D.D. Westbrook, who was twice arrested on domestic violence charges. So, although Donald Trump never managed to buy an NFL team, with a league experiencing a public relations crisis, more focus on its swampy ways, and now a ratings plummet, it may well be the president who has the last laugh.